This is not a Hollywood movie. This is not a five o'clock news story about your local fire department. I only know how to be honest with people when I talk about the fire service. So this is a raw conversation about what we face, what my brothers face. What we do is special. When the air brake on the truck sets and you open that door, you're going to bat. It's a terrifyingly beautiful thing. It's chaos and it's peace. It's something we wouldn't want to live without, yet sometimes it's the hardest thing to live with. Being a firefighter has taught me so much in my life. I don't know what I would do without it. My name is Caleb Shetler, and I'm a volunteer firefighter in Rutgersville, Virginia, Station 2. These are my brothers. These are a few of the guys I've been through the toughest of days with. This is our story. Andrew McDaniel, a firefighter, EMT. I've been here since uh, July 2015, so we're going on roughly three and a half years. Uh, Nate Creighton, 26 years old. Sean Ryan, I'm the chief here at Rutgersville Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, Mike Thompson, uh, they call me Tyrone, 24 years old. So this fire station in particular is uh, it's very interesting. It's uh, described it like an anomaly. We're relatively busy. We run anywhere between 1,000 to 1,200 calls consistently a year. We get anywhere between 40 and 50 uh, working structure fires a year. Um, you know, not a single month goes by that we're going out to an actual working incident, if you will. So we cover um, about 14,000 residents at our, at our max capacity, if you will. So we have everything from rural homes, old farmhouses, to three to four story apartment buildings, to multi-million dollar mansions. So our first due is so diverse that you just don't know what you're gonna get at any given time. We have had weekends where one of our wildest weekends here in 48 hours, they ran 86 calls. Um, they didn't get off the rig for that entire time between fires, structural vehicle, brush, lines down. So it's a busy house for the size. A little over a dozen firefighters are all the active members that we typically have to run these jobs. And they run them well. driving factors behind this film specifically um, has been an accumulation of the fatal fires we've had in the past five years and, and watching how um, the brothers of this station responded to that um, and then even more recently the, the Matthew Mill fire. Cross Street, Iroquois Trail, Structure Fire, Stations 2, 1, 3, and 4. As you see, Burst 29 is arriving on the scene. I got heavy fire pushing at the Alpha, Charlie, and Delta sides of the building. Hello, out of the command. I'm coming down Matthews Mill. I got two tanks up plus a driver. What you need? I need you to bring me a pack of guys, and I need them now. Water's coming. Water's coming. Matthew Mill fire, 5 o'clock in the morning. Toned out for a structure fire. Uh, reported people were trapped. Got on scene, well, got down here, um, jumped on 23, I was officer of the rig that night. Um, McDandy was in the back, Efron was driving. Uh, confirmed reports of three people trapped, one juvenile and two two adults. Didn't know exactly where they were, arrived on location. A lot of fire was uh, uh, already engulfed that house. Uh, we had uh, confirmed 
entrapment on the Alpha Bravo corner on the basement, so a split level house. Went, did my 360 as officer on the rig. Literally got beat back by fire um, and heat. Literally had to run and go put my mask on, then come back and grab my gloves and my hook. Um, at that time, I saw Mongo going to the front door with the, the hand line. Told him, since the bulk of the fire was on the rear of the house, hey, I need the hand line on the Charlie side. Um, we had firms reports that they were right inside that window. We spent multiple time, uh, a lot of time, in that one room trying to find them. Didn't find anybody. Um, McDandy, he was the first one in. I was the second one. He was overcome by fire. We're at this point, we're screaming on the ha on the radio for a handline because it was getting bad. Um, they brought us a handline to the window. He grabbed the handline and we tried to make the push. We made the push to the door of that room and got beat back again. And then we finally overcame it, pushed it down, found a bedroom on the left. Um, couldn't see anything. I knew there was fire right there. I mean, it was all around us pretty much. Like literally, you go into a fire pit, that's pretty much what we were in. Fire was everywhere, heat was everywhere. It was really just us on, on scene for a good 10 minutes, um, five, 10 minutes at least. We get there, I mean, there's there's paint cans exploding. For some reason they had a bunch of cars back there and they all caught on fire. And so tires are popping. Magnesium blowing off and all kinds of stuff. Car horns are getting stuck on. But uh, at least it's one of those things you just kind of fall back on your training and just like, at that point, I mean, we, we were we were scratching at everything. Um, he, he makes it sound like it was not too much, but it was, it was pretty much everybody tried everything all the time for like three hours. I mean, we just going and going and going and going and going and going. Then I, as I was looking around, um, first floor was deteriorating. It was already partially collapsing and it was steadily coming closer. So I, as the officer that night, I'd, I had to make the decision, hey, I, I remember it specifically, I looked at him and said, we got to get the fuck out of here. Hey, hey, we're about to have to call this shit, bro. The collapse is starting to happen. Bro, hey, it's my call. I mean, again, we, we're not here to play God, but I made the call to keep my guys alive. And so made the decision to back out and then come back in with another crew. A handful of us, you know, in the first gen engine company gave it all our all. You know, we were told that, you know, hey, there's three people inside this house. Um, and we found multiple ways to get in, finally made it way our in. And like I said, just keep working and pushing and pushing and pushing. It got to the point where we had to be pulled out of a window and and guys were freaking out because we're, we're off gassing like to an extent that people have never seen before and we were just exhausted after that. As me and McDandy walked out, uh, they drug us out the window and thank God for that because my, my, my body was ready to quit. Um, but after that, you know, they just de uh, deteriorated from there. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of tears, a lot of... I guess you could say failure in my mind. A deadly house fire has claimed the lives of three people this morning in Greene County. The flames have been put out, but the investigation into what caused the blaze continues. This is what it looked like earlier, smoke still billowing from the roof of that home. The aggressive fire broke out around 5 a.m. on Matthew Mill Road. That's just off Route 607. More than half a dozen fire companies needed to be called out to help with that fire. A few firefighters were even burned through their gear while trying to rescue others. I was getting off of work and I, I got on scene and I remember looking at everybody and I had, you know, some of the biggest of men, some of the toughest Jakes that I've ever worked with. I mean, their heads are down, you know, they're, they're crying in masks, they've got gloved hands that they're comforting one another in. And I remember getting fixated, there was a bandage on the ground, just a standard wrapped bandage that someone had taken off. And uh, I didn't really think too much of it until I started talking to guys. I just, I pulled them close, told them I loved them, that we're gonna get through it. I love them, just kept doing it. And then I saw Mongo, and he had this bandage on his hand. It was wrapped. And I asked him, I said, what happened? He told me he had gotten burned, and uh, you know they, they were attempting rescues, and he'd, he'd sustained burns. And I asked him about the bandage on the ground. He said, Chief, we still had fire to fight. The, uh, the medics told me I couldn't go back in with the, with the bandage. So I took it off and uh, 
I just remember that because I, I was trying to hold back my tears to stay strong for my guys, but I remember thinking that we have such a brotherhood that he is going to take these burns, disregard his pain, put them back on to be with his guys to finish this mission. And at that time, it was it was unburying, you know, a small child and two other victims with their hands. And um, I just remember watching them and just how powerful that day was. It 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 made so many things feel small, and and the things to focus on just were illuminated immediately and I was just uh, the sense of sadness was almost taken away by the sense of pride that I had and just to see the compassion in these guys it's everything we just talked about I got to witness you know none of these guys were ashamed I mean these are big jakes these are firefighting dudes these are the guys you want on a fire and they're all they all felt broken because they all felt that they had failed and uh, it was amazing seeing them come together and I think that stuck with me more than almost any fatal fire that could have happened. That impact is still with me and it kind of gives me some, some peace when I, when I think about times where I felt I failed. You know, I failed a victim, I failed a family, I failed a, a son, mother, daughter. Um, it gives me a lot of peace. I wasn't at that call. Um, I actually wasn't available to run that call. Um, I was in the county over and wasn't able to respond. But I had my radio and I was listening to the radio traffic. Um, I chose to do that and it was tough. Um, to hear what your brothers are going through and not be able to help them uh, was an experience that I hadn't ever had before. Um, and I could hear when they couldn't make entry and I could hear when they had the fire out and were recovering the bodies that they weren't able to pull out. And, uh, and that was tough. Um, I think I had a lot of guilt that I wasn't there. Um, and working through that was uh, a challenge. Um, but like a lot of these things go after time and, and talking it out and coming together as, like, as a community in this fire station. We understood that, you know, this is, this is part of it. I don't think we talk about PTSD a lot because it's an uncomfortable topic. Um, I think a lot of us, myself included, I think I was raised with, we don't talk about our feelings. Um, you know, the job's hard, rookie, get over it. Um, you're going to see stuff on the job, rookie. You got to move past. You got to find ways to deal with it. So we're almost taught at a young age, you're going to see stuff. It's going to be rough. You got to find ways to deal with it. So we almost feel we've been conditioned to, we've seen that stuff. We don't need to talk about it. It's accepted. What do you, what do you want to do, rookie? You want to leave? You know? So I think early on in a lot of fire service careers, it's, it's conditioned inside of us that we, we shouldn't talk about it. And here now that we're kind of putting a light on it, a lot of, like I said, a lot of good people have lost their lives to PTSD because it's, it's went untreated. Uh, recently, a friend of mine committed suicide because of this. So I think, the, I think the time is at hand to make sure you can raise your hand and talk. You know, when you go into this stuff, it's, you've always expected it, right? Um, the guys that have been in it for a little while always tell you that this is what you're going to see, this is what you're going to do. Um, and while they, they tell us that you know, if something bothers you, open up about it, you kind of don't want to. You, you feel scared or maybe you're going to get judged. Um, so you just kind of keep it internally and, and keep pushing through. And sometimes some people, they figure it out on their own, and other times they get the ultimate sacrifice. I think we're so used to being the ones that help people that we're not comfortable or ready to always be helped or even recognize our need to be helped. I mean, when you're trained in your mind mentally over and over again that I'm the one helping, I'm the one serving, I'm the one going out and helping this person, then you kind of shut off that pathway in your brain of needing help, of being helped or being in, in trouble. Um, we train so hard, we work so hard down here. We take pride in the fact that we're, we're the ones going in, we're being aggressive, we're being proactive on every call, and we don't 
often lose when we fight we fight to win and we're not used to losing and that's kind of how we view it as needing help is sometimes is like is losing so it's kind of that mindset i think that people shy away from getting help a lot we're macho men we type a really type a personalities we don't care about our feelings we try not to i mean tradition in the fire service is always brought to like just suck it up move on it'll, it'll get better um so I guess that's part of the tradition of the fire service is we'll just keep it inside, bottle it up, and we'll just move on because that's what we've always done. That's what we're always going to keep doing. <clears throat> and with it just now coming out with studies and everything, a lot of people are you know, scared to talk about it because they don't want to seem like they're weak in front of their you know, other people. We all are definitely aware that sometimes we're going to come up short. I mean... Like I said, we, we fight to win, but we know that not everything's in our control. And I think there's a time to grieve, and there's a time to, to put your arm around your brother. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to pack up and come, come back. We're supposed to be the strong firemen that come to the scene. We're supposed to, almost as a job, live with the trauma of others. And sometimes, you know, our our wells get full. Everybody struggles in silence and almost feels that we don't have a lot of people we can go to or we don't think that someone would understand if we come to them or we think that we're going to show weakness by coming to someone or they think they're going to put us on the, um, we call it on the, the psych hold. I think it's still kind of a taboo subject to bring up that, it, hey, chief, this call bothered me. Chief, I'm not sleeping. Or just me coming to a lieutenant, lieutenant, I'm, that call bothered me. A lot of people don't understand what firemen, medics, everything, every one of us in public safety go through. And a lot of the times it's, it almost starts off the conversation with what's the worst call you've ever ran. And, uh, I had someone ask me that a while back and I asked them just Frank, you want me to relive my ongoing nightmares for your entertainment. And it was kind of, they got taken back like, Oh wait, what? It's like, it, you know, the things we see, I mean, we see end of life quite often. Sometimes it's traumatic, sometimes it's peaceful, sometimes it's barbaric. So it's, it's, a, it's an area that we don't talk about because it's just not out there. Everyone knows the military, there's consequences in joining, there's going to be death, there's going to be killing, you're going to lose friends. But here lately, I mean, we're up to 72 firefighters killed in the line of duty. It's a dangerous job. We see, um, we see all types of atrocities and we learn in the firehouse. So if you have a culture of just quiet rookie deal with it, it doesn't end well. So you want to try to build that culture of, hey, Lieutenant, can I, can I pull you aside for a minute? You know? Uh, and I never really thought that like, I would personally be affected by PTSD. Um, I was, you know, I would always tell myself that I was way too young in my career, um, going on five years. So it's not like I've spent like a long time in, um, so I would always tell myself, yeah, once, you know, at the end of your career, maybe you could look back and have some hard times, but I always thought I was too young. Um, and it wasn't until, um, May of 2018 this year that I had my first experience with it. And after that, it was kind of solidified it as, yes, this is something that I want to get help for, uh, for myself and for my brothers. So that's kind of been the driving force. I was diagnosed three years ago uh, with PTSD, and I, I like to think that I manage it. Um, there's specific sounds anymore that almost trigger me. Um, kettles boiling, just any type of scream. Um, a lot of things kind of set me off because those screams are what brings me back. Uh, mother screams, bystanders screaming, those, those things of they know they just lost their loved one. Every Every call that I run like that, fatal house fires, um, fatal vehicle accidents, any, anything of that nature, a little part of them stays with me, almost like some of that victim's pain transfers to me and I carry it with me for the rest of my career. You know, I, I think for a long time I wouldn't have put a name to it. Uh, I just think it was just, you know, a hazard of the job that is just things that have come back to get me and revisit. Um, but after talking with a 
talking with a doc a few years ago and hearing it out loud, it's easier to accept and kind of understand that I'm not crazy, that it is normal. It makes sense that in this career that you're going to have those bumps in the night. You know, we've been told to open up about it, talk about it, and especially use those guys that were there on the call and talk to them, just share your experiences. And so a lot of guys have noticed will actually sit down and, and they'll actually just kind of write out a few notes about a call. And every so often they might revisit it if it's bothering them. And, you know, it's hard to say, like, why, why that helps you, but surprisingly it does. I think what we need to raise awareness of PTSD is just just educating people on the basics, educating the family of the volunteer firefighter of, of what to expect um, when you come in contact with the firefighter, how to kind of go about having a conversation with them, um, and just and knowing what's at stake at all levels. So I think education is the primary goal is, is kind of what I'm pushing towards is educating the public on what a volunteer firefighter has to do. I mean, they're, they're not career. We, we run calls and we take time out of our lives to, to come down here. And it's a very interesting dynamic because we still have other jobs, whether that be career fire somewhere else or whether it be a different field. Um, if we're not at work and we come to run a call, you know, if that call may last an hour, two hours, we're in a very intense situation for those couple hours. And then we have to separate ourselves from that world and go to work. And I think sometimes that's, that can be a challenge for other people to understand what we go through, um, to just go to work, but then two hours before you were, you know, watching someone suffer, um, or exerting yourself um, to extreme measures and then just kind of checking out of that and going to work. Um, so I think educating people on what volunteer firefighters do um, and then how they kind of process things. If you run that call, sometimes it's not even that call in your mind, but it's a call that maybe was emotionally taxing, maybe someone did die, maybe it was just a, a, a large fire that a lot of people were going in and getting stressed. I think that quick checkup, even just a hand on the shoulder, brother, you doing okay? And then a follow-up back at the firehouse. Hey, brother, you doing all right? Maybe the next day, you seem a little off, man. Did you sleep okay? Did you, did you, you need to talk? You need to do that? Not pushing so hard that you want to push them away, but you want to start seeing those changes and start working those changes. Um, we'd had some incidents and no one wanted to talk about it. So what we ended up doing was we just took a trip to King's Dominion and we were gone for a weekend. There was no need to wire we're leaving for the weekend. Everybody knew everybody needed a reset. We're going to get away from the pager. We're going to get away from the radios. We're going to get out of the county. So there is no obligation. There's no feeling of we got to run this call, chief. It's we're three hours away, guys. This one's not ours. This one, someone else will take it from here. We, we're going to go reset. So being able to recognize as a chief, knowing my people, knowing when something's bothering them, recognizing those changes of behavior, um, is hugely important for me. I feel almost an obligation to not let them down, that I don't want them sitting in their bedroom alone, wondering what's next, can they run this next call? And I don't want us to dwell about on it you know, daily. I want us to recognize that it's a part of our career, it's a part of the life we choose. Um, but if we have each other's back, we can rise up out of it. We can get the help we need, we can move on, and. and and keep doing the best job in the world. I volunteer because if I don't, who will? And I look at, I have a very valuable skill set. I have something, a, a, if, a gift if you will, not to sound corny, I have a set of skills that benefit others. And I have a mindset that allows me to work with others to keep the public. We have a, we have a motto here, it's for them and I'm able to portray that. So when these volunteers come in, there's no payment, it's long hours, no pay, hard work, and they're doing it because they're selfless and they wanna help. And we by far have some of the best in the business here. Of I've worked with great career departments and I would not trade a single one of these guys. And they do it because they are all heart. 
all heart and compassion. And they, are, they will, at any moment, risk their personal safety for someone else. Yeah, most definitely. Um, probably the best brotherhood, I could say, out of a volunteer station. Um, I mean, we hang out on the side. We party with each other. We hang out. We help each other. If like somebody's moving, we help them. Um, if somebody's down, we talk to them stuff like that so we do a lot of stuff outside of the fire service with each other and it's just an extension of the family yeah it's pretty cool uh, I mean we all pretty much do most everything together um, whether some people they go catch deer and others uh, I don't know, like golf snowboard uh, do all kinds of random stuff together we're all kind of deep down driven by the same thing and you know it's granted in the job is to help the community out, but maybe there's something else about it, maybe a little bit more uh, personal. Um, maybe it gives everybody a, a sense of purpose. It's given me a sense of purpose. I volunteer as a firefighter because it's the best job in the world. Uh, you can't top this. You can't top the, the things you get to do, um, the things you get to see. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of injuries and trauma that we see, but you also get to see the, the faces of hope and the, and you get to watch the courage of your brothers and, and you get to be a part of something a lot bigger than yourself. And I, I just wake up and, I, and I, I tell myself how blessed I am every day to be able to be in the fire service and be able to do this job. And it's something I want to be in my life as long as I can. I look at them all and remind them, this isn't for the t-shirt. You're here, you're gonna do long hours. This is one of the last few blue collar jobs you can walk in untrained. You could be a pizza boy one minute and a fireman the next. We are public safety, we are public servants. We owe it all to the citizens of this county. We owe it all to the citizens of the city that you serve. We are here for them. They are not here for us. It is our job to make sure that we provide them with the highest level of service possible. And at any given time, you have to be willing to put it all on the line for someone else that you do not know and you may not like, but this is what you're signed up for. Whether you're a career volunteer, you voluntarily took this position. And remember that this job owes you nothing and you owe it everything. truck goes out with red blue lights and a siren sound they race so fast because they know that in times like this every second counts consumed by fear and smoke filled tears the families pray for the ones they love while they rush and without second guessing for forcing to a burning house no matter the day no matter the hour, without a delay, they answer the call. Extraordinary men and women, born with bravery and selfless service, under the flames, risking it all. They answer the call. haunt their dreams because once you've heard them you can't forget but still they fight to save our lives knowing if they died it would all be worth it no matter the day no matter the hour without a delay they answer the call extraordinary men and women Born with bravery and selfless service Under the flames, risking it all They answer the call They answer the call Their pride runs deep, their bond stays strong They 
stand up tall No matter the day No matter the hour